Hello, and thank you for tuning into Answers from the Lab, where we share Mayo Clinic knowledge and advancements on the state of testing and science from laboratory leaders and the people who are making it happen behind the scenes. Hi, I'm Dr. Bobby Pritt, the Chair of the Division of Clinical Microbiology here at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I'm Bill Maurice. I'm the Chair of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic here in Rochester, Minnesota and across the Midwest, and also the President of Mayo Clinic Laboratories. So thanks everyone again for joining us today. We have a special guest who is Shannon Bennett, the Director of Regulatory Affairs within our Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology here at Mayo Clinic. He has a principal focus on clinical test, uh, laboratory test development, optimization, verification, and validation. And Shannon is gonna be joining us today to talk about lab developed tests. Uh, That is tests that are developed by individual laboratories rather than commercial manufacturers and how some of the upcoming regulation may impact these tests. So maybe Shannon, so maybe you can introduce yourself to just give us a little bit of your background so people can know who you are. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Shannon Bennett. I'm the Director of Regulatory Affairs for the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic. So my primary function is really working with our test development uh, teams to ensure that they are meeting all the necessary regulations around uh, test validation and test implementation. It's great having you here today. Yeah, Bill and I have been talking about having you on our show for a long time now. So maybe you could just talk through for, um, it's timely because we just had a new FDA commissioner proposed, uh, Robert Califf. So that will be under consideration. This is a topic we'll get into. It's been under consideration for quite some time in terms of the potential FDA oversight of laboratory developed tests. But maybe you could just talk a little bit about, you know, I've heard different terms used like homebrew, which mm-hmm. I think is a little bit misleading. So maybe you could just talk a little bit about what 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 constitutes a lab developed test. Uh, Dr. Bobby just mentioned, kind of touched on it, but maybe how would you define it, Shannon? Sure. So so broadly speaking, there's kind of two different types of tests to use in a clinical laboratory. First, you have your um, manufactured in vitro diagnostic or IVD kit. So these are test kits that are made in a factory, essentially. And those manufacturers need to submit data and a bunch of paperwork to the FDA. And the FDA will um, clear or approve their test kit, or in some cases will say, Um, this type of test is exempt from FDA review. But one way or the other, the FDA will look at that and then give that company permission to then sell that test kit to laboratories. The other type of test is what we would call a laboratory developed test. And there's a couple different flavors of, of that. So a laboratory may create a test from scratch entirely um, and then you know, develop and validate and then implement that test. Or they may take one of those uh, manufactured test kits and modify it. So for example, I take a test kit that is used in serum and I modify it to now use it with body fluid. So it's a different specimen type. That is now an LDT and I am considered the manufacturer of that test because I have modified what it was originally intended for. Yeah, that's a great uh, description and definitely better than homebrew. I don't like to use that term either, kind of colloquial. Um, so can you tell us a bit about the history of oversight of these tests? Because obviously labs have been using these lab developed tests for quite some time. Um, so we have a pretty diverse group of people listening to us and maybe you could just kind of educate everyone on how, how a lab would be able to use these tests for routine clinical care. Sure. So specific to the FDA, so the FDA received authorization to regulate medical devices in the 1970s. And so that would be things like, you know, hip implants and pacemakers, but also IVD test kits that are manufactured in those factories I mentioned earlier. Um, And even um, in the 70s, the FDA said that they had enforcement authority over laboratory developed tests as well but they just chose not to exercise that. They use something called enforcement discretion. And the rationale at the time is that um, laboratory developed tests were used um, just in a a local population. And so the number of people affected would be low and LDTs were typically uh, simpler in their design. And so overall, not that risky. So therefore FDA took a hands-off approach. Um, They have periodically over the years um, used their authority to, uh, for example, pull tests LDTs off the market if they felt that they were risky, but broadly speaking, they take a hands-off approach. Fast forward to 2014, and the FDA uh, 
proclaimed essentially that LDTs have gotten more complex. Um, and you also have large reference laboratories like Mayo Clinic, where we get samples in from around the country and around the world. So we test patients beyond just kind of our, you know, Minnesota, Southern Minnesota area. Um, and so FDA in 2014 released a draft guidance document. That's how they make their rules. Um, and indicated how they would like to more formally and more forcefully regulate laboratory developed tests. And they would largely do it as medical devices. Now that would have been disastrous for the laboratory industry. And so there was a lot of pushback and FDA eventually ended up uh, not finalizing that guidance document. It's still available on the web. You can still take a look at it, but they never finalized it. Instead, they released a white paper in 2017 that essentially said, um, we think a legislative approach versus a guidance approach is the right way to go. And kind of here's our general idea of how we would go about doing that. So a year later in 2018, a discussion draft of a piece of legislation called the Valid Act was released for discussion. Um, the Valid Act is the Verifying Accurate Leading Edge IVCT Development Act. Um, I think there's an entire office in Congress that comes up with acronyms. So that's the Valid <laughs> Act. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, an IVCT is a new type of product. It's an in vitro clinical test. And so that is an umbrella term that would cover both IVD test kits, manufactured kits, and lab developed tests. So those two things would be uh, regulated in the same way by the FDA formally. Um, the Valid Act was first introduced last summer in 2020. Um, obviously with the pandemic, it didn't really go anywhere, but it was um, reintroduced this past uh, June or July. Um, and we, we think that it's, a, it's got a viable path forward. There is a, a competing piece of legislation called the VITAL Act, that is the Verified Innovative Testing in American Laboratories Act, another great acronym, um, and that takes an opposite approach. So uh, a little bit of a sidetrack here, clinical laboratories are already heavily regulated by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, under a bill called CLIA, the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments. Um, and, you know, CLIA is very focused on laboratory operations, your day-to-day -day running of the laboratory. Um, there's a little bit in CLIA about, you know, test validation, but it, it's admittedly a little bit uh, light on that front. So Valid would take test validation and test development and put that into the hands of the FDA. The VITAL Act would strength, seeks to strengthen CLIA and essentially remove FDA from the picture altogether for laboratory developed tests. So these are competing bills that are essentially saying FDA should regulate LDTs or CMS should regulate LDTs. Probably for people to understand and frame it up, what some of the pushback has been starting really around 2014, Shannon, um, when you mentioned that is that there were some, for first pushback was the argument that actually um, in the, the ability of a pathologist in a laboratory to develop a test to meet a patient need is actually the practice of medicine, right? Which is actually, it does not fall under the purview of FDA. So there has been some pushback back and forth of whether FDA truly has the statutory authority. But I think my understanding, I mean, people by and large acknowledging that, you know, are acquiescing that it does. And that the legislative approach has the advantages of being more public in terms of the opportunity for public kind of input as opposed to FDA, which is a lot more sort of just rulemaking. Is that, that's a big difference between the two processes, if I'm not mistaken, right, Shannon? Yeah, that's correct. If, if the 2014 approach had gone forward and FDA just issued a guidance document, they'd essentially have carte blanche to do whatever they want. The legislative approach, you know, has its pros and cons as well. But one of the benefits is it's it's public and it's also somewhat locked in, so to speak. You know, FDA could update a guidance at any time, whereas if something is codified in legislation, that's the way it is. Yep, got it. So it gives the labs a little bit more transparency on what's happening and then a little bit more surety that's not going to change too too quickly. But um, in my sense, the other thing I think is, is interesting and we've sort of forgotten about it was there were, as I recall, there was just before the pandemic, the FDA started to move in this direction uh, with with in the, in the area of pharmacogenomics and pharmacogenomic testing, I think. Isn't that right? Yeah. So they, they were really focused um, like in the 2018 timeframe on pharmacogenetic testing, which is essentially 
um, testing to see someone's predisposition towards how well they'll respond to a particular kind of drug. Um, and there was a laboratory uh, on the East Coast that was making some marketing claims that FDA disagreed with. And FDA um, had some interactions with them. And long story short, that laboratory removed all pharmacogenetic testing from their test menu. So functionally, yeah. Um, they, they no longer offered that testing as a result of their interaction with the FDA. Shannon, I was going to ask you um, if either of these two acts were to go through, what would the implications be on labs such as Mayo Clinic Laboratories uh, for complying with these acts? Sure. So the, the least disruptive would, would likely be the VITAL Act because it would expand CLIA, which laboratories are already very familiar with. If you're running a clinical laboratory in this country, you are meeting CLIA requirements. Um, I will say I think the VITAL Act has a little bit of a, a tougher road right now. Um, it has one sponsor, one Republican sponsor in the Senate. So it is um, one party, one uh, chamber of com uh, Congress. Um, the Valid Act, on the other hand, does have co-sponsors from both parties in both chambers of Congress. So it has a little bit uh, easier glide path, if you will, um, although it's by no means assured. The other thing to, th to remember with Valid as well is it's very unlikely that Valid would pass on its own. Most likely it would be tucked into some other legislation. And there just so happens to be a piece of must-pass legislation. Uh, it's called the Medical Device User Fee Agreement or MEDUFA doesn't really matter what that is, but it is a very logical um, vehicle potentially for um, valid to be added into. And MEDUFA would go up for a vote probably late next summer, early next fall. So I think it's reasonably likely that valid could get tucked into that MEDUFA legislation. So, so what does a valid world look like for laboratories? So um, I should also mention, so vital is seven pages uh valid is about 245 pages wow. so there, there's a lot of detail in valid complex yes yeah so the good news first of all there is a grandfathering clause so any ldt on the market prior to valid going into effect would be grandfathered so for any tests that we're currently running we wouldn't necessarily need to proactively submit a bunch of documentation to the fda that's good um, however there are some caveats there uh, FDA is going to create a, a massive database to contain all information about all clinical laboratory tests that exist in the country, and that would include grandfathered tests. And so within one year of this database being available, laboratories would need to submit a bunch of information about their tests into this, this database. So that could be a pretty significant clerical burden or administrative undertaking. Um, particularly for like an academic medical center that typically has a very large uh, LDT test menu. The other caveat is modifications do need to be submitted to the FDA as well, or at least most modifications. So even though you have a test that's grandfathered, if you make a change to that test, you may need to submit that to the FDA anyway. In the laboratories, we make changes to our tests not infrequently. We're always looking for opportunities to make our tests better, cheaper, um, use less patient sample volume, faster. There's many, many reasons. And many of those changes don't have a meaningfully meaningful impact on the analytical validity of the test, but they are a change. And so FDA would, would want to see those. So grandfathering is good, but it's, it's not perfect. Um, so valid. Um, has a, a test classification strategy or risk classification uh, strategy for determining what needs to be submitted to the FDA. Um, so largely speaking, a test is either low risk or it's high risk. If it's low risk, you don't need to submit at all. If it's high risk, you do need to submit. Now the challenge with that is lab tests oftentimes are not black and white like that. Um, you may have a test that you look at and say, well, you know, this really isn't low risk, but it isn't exactly high risk either. But since those are my two choices, um, our concern is that tests may get up classified into high risk when that, that maybe isn't appropriate either, but it's our only option. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that is an area where there's been quite a lot of feedback both to the FDA and to the Valid Act sponsors that a, a three-tiered approach probably makes, makes more sense, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, one really big new thing for labs as well is that review step. You know, for most laboratories today, 
you develop a test, you validate that it works appropriately, and you then offer it to your patients. Under Valid Act, you would develop it, validate it, submit it to the FDA, and wait for perhaps three months for FDA to get back to you and approve your test. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, over that three months, you've got patients that could benefit from that test that you cannot offer because you need to get FDA approval before you offer that test. So that's going to be a big change for labs. One thing I think is really important, you, you kind of touched on, Shannon, here as we start to think about, because anticipating that some form of regulation of lab developed tests is coming, um, just particularly right now, this has been talked about in my seven years and prior even of being in this role, it's made it through different administrations, the current administration and Congress is going to be more pro-regulatory and as is the new if, if Dr. Califf is appointed as FDA commissioner, it's something he has been interested in. So it, there's coming, but I think that's, you know, one of the big differences for labs, as I understand is, is we think a lot right now about the analytical validation of tests, but what FDA requires, just like they do for, for drugs and devices, they think about intended use. So we have to think also about how that test is being used in clinical decision-making and actually having data to support that. And that's a lot of what, that'll be pretty new for labs, I think, if I'm, if I'm reading it right. Yeah, you're, you're spot on. You know, we're used to demonstrating that our test can measure this analyte. That's your analytical validity. That's great. FDA is also looking for clinical validity though. You know, what, what part does that analyte play in this disease process? And so laboratories will need to provide evidence for both of those things. It's not just enough to say, I can accurately measure this analyte. It's, I can accurately measure this analyte and here's what it means. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, it's part of the whole clinical picture. A lot of times, well, a test result should never be taken in a vacuum. So if you have a positive result, usually what we say is that supports a clinical diagnosis of a certain disease, but it doesn't in and of itself mean the patient has that disease. Right. Yeah. But so I think going forward, and you know, one of the things, I, I, the two things that come to mind to me are, in the complexities, as, as uh, Bobby was just mentioning, we have to stay engaged, and you've talked about a lot. We really have, as, as laboratory and people in our profession, have to stay engaged, particularly if, if Valid is moving through to talk, you know, be vocal with within our organizations, with our with our representatives, our congressional representatives, to try and just really help them understand what exactly how the lab supports care and. Yes, we want safe tests and we want to make sure those tests are safe and accurate and that the decisions made from them are sound, but we don't want to actually have barriers to people getting them. And that means we have to have a voice in, the, in this, but also then to start to work with our clinical colleagues to prepare for a future state, because also clinicians will have to get you. A lot of times the pressure we get from is from the clinicians saying, well, can you just run this test? That was back even when the pandemic was rolling out. You know, when they, before we had the process to get EUA for, for lab developed tests, people were like, well, why can't you just run? Why can't, you know, you and Dr. Pritz just create a COVID test and run it for our patients? You know, that was back in January, 2020. So I think those to me are kind of the things that stay engaged and start to prepare. I think are the two things that, did that seem good messages for people, Shannon? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think it's been a little bit of a slow burn here this fall because Congress has been very busy with other things. But I think, you know, beginning next year, when they kind of turn their attention to other things, and it, with, you know, again, with Madufa coming down the road, with that vehicle coming down the road that Valid could be attached to, I think things will start moving pretty quickly. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, so we'll just have to stay tuned. But I agree, Bill. We need to be involved and start preparing now. Start thinking about what a post-valid or post-regulatory world would look like for clinical labs so we can keep serving our patients. Well, great discussion, Shannon. Again, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we may have to have you back next year when it gets when we know more about what's coming down the pipe. Sounds great. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much for tuning in to Answers from the Lab. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to tune in every Thursday and every other Tuesday.